The date is July 11, 2013, and my name is Carol Turner, and I'm interviewing Robert Bruce Miller, attorney, for the Maria Rogers Oral History Program of the Carnegie Branch Library of Boulder. And our opening question is always the same, which is, where and when were you born? Well, I, I hope the answer is a little different than everyone else, but it's not very <laughs> exciting. Um, and I, I come from uh, Larimer County, and uh, I was actually born in Arizona, but I moved up there when I was three months old. So um, I'm, I came down, came down from Larimer County, and uh, it was rural then. A ranch? And still then. Yeah, we. Uh, had some horses on the south end of the mountain there, and uh, and I came down to Colorado uh, CU school, and um, my mother had a a shop up in Estes Park, and we had horses on the that my great uncle would bring in and take out for training purposes and selling and. <clears throat> we uh, so I grew up in that atmosphere, and then came down to school here, and uh, didn't leave. Went to undergraduate here, and then graduate law school here, and in Boulder. In Boulder, okay. Here in Boulder, and I spent a year as a law clerk to a federal judge in Denver. So I was out of I was out of Boulder for <laughs> that year, and that's it for one year and you came back to Boulder and opened a practice. I did, on my own. And I went in with uh, a, another lawyer, Roger Stevens, who was a local lawyer here and well-known, uh, excellent, brilliant lawyer. And then, uh, and then I went on my own from him. And that's kind of what I've been doing ever since. Okay. I do a mix of criminal and civil trial work and it's never changed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So the first case we're going to talk about, um, which is the case that I've discussed with you before, um, it's the John Kirkland and Charles Goldman case from June 21st, 1968. And um, that must have been really, really early in your career. It was. It was very early in my career and it was, you know, sort of, <laughs> it's sort of odd to have one of the largest cases happen first, but yeah. it was, it was a, it was a very it was an exciting time because the it was early with the you know sort of the flower children and the hippies coming through, and I was a young lawyer and uh, I had sort of a storefront office, and uh, I was doing my own typing. You may you probably wouldn't recall, but that was back in the days of carbon paper. Oh, I, I mean, remember five, carbon paper. Five <laughs> <laughs> five copies. You didn't want to make a mistake. Where was your office? It was uh, over on uh, right off of Pearl, which was then a street, not a walking mall. Right. And um, so, and the courthouse was right down there too. And right. so that's the way it was at that time. And I remember, uh, I remember the hippies coming through. I mean, it was, as I said, it was an exciting time. And I lived at that time over um, just off of um, Folsom, which was then 24th Street. And uh, there were a lot of people living in the same area with you know, they were young. You wouldn't want to call them yuppies by any means. They were blue collar type people, but we were all very friendly. And so it was a, it was a different time in Boulder, which was a much smaller community. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm getting ahead of right, where we yeah. were going, but I will tell you that it was, Boulder County was very rural at that time. I mean, yes, Boulder was much smaller. It's changed completely now. It's used, you call it urban liberal it was it was rural and fairly conservative so yeah, I, anyway. remember. I, I know you have other questions yes so yeah so yeah why not let's go back to the case if you could ex kind of explain what was that case well they that is uh, John Kirkland and Goldman were both charged with vagrancy and a lot of people coming through at that time the young people were being charged with vagrancy and, and they'd go to jail on it. They'd be jailed and then there'd be a trial and then they'd be sentenced to 30 days in jail for vagrancy. And um, actually, I got to say, um, some, some young law students had working for the legal aid clinic had come to me and said, what did I think? I said, I don't like it. And we, we uh, took these two 
and file a lawsuit in federal court. Uh, it were was, they in jail at they that were, time? Uh, they they, they started out in jail. They started out in jail at that time. And while the lawsuit was going, it took a while, they actually went to trial uh, in Boulder and they were convicted. They, I mean, there was no winning one of those cases. And we're going to get to the statute in a moment. Yeah. And that is a statute. It's a state statute. And almost every state, state at that time, okay. in fact, I think every state at that time, had a state vagrancy statute. Okay, and it wasn't a Boulder versus Denver no, or Fed No, no, no. There, there are other okay. what's called municipal ordinances, and I actually took on some of those and had some of those declared unconstitutional, and then some other lawyers also did something similar as time went by, and so Boulder eventually got rid of those because they were getting knocked around pretty good. That, that is the city attorney's office, but what happened is the statute itself came from old Europe and was carried over uh, to America. It was, if you go back to the history of it, it was to keep, it was vagabonds, it was vagrancy, they were vagabonds. It was to keep, actually to keep the, the serfs on the land. It made it illegal, illegal to be wandering around without a job. And so they couldn't, the serfs couldn't leave. And it's, there's a whole social thing going on there that we won't we don't have time to talk about, yeah. but it's really pretty fascinating. Yeah. And it came over to America and it was used to keep, in quotations, undesirables. It was also used to keep people that the, the police didn't like for various reasons and probably getting a little ahead of myself, but you may recall um, in Cape Fear, Robert Mitchum was the bad guy in that and they picked him up right away when the lawyer wanted him out of there because he was stalking him. And so Mitchum was arrested on vagrancy and he showed evidence that he'd inherited his mother's property and he had $32,000 in the bank. I just know why I remember that part of that movie. <laughs> but anyway, um, there is a good example. He rested on vagrancy and right. they could show he had money. But didn't, um, weren't those men in somebody's apartment, that was my understanding, I read somewhere that they were actually not sort of wandering around Pearl Street or whatever, they were inside somebody's apartment, yeah. making brownies or something or other. I think we talked about that, they were making pies. Yeah, yeah they Probably were. pot brownies. No, they weren't, they were <laughs> making regular. pies. Oh yeah, they, if, believe me, if they'd been making pot brownies, it would have <laughs> been a felony. Much worse. Different, yeah. different story. Uh, a, a gram of marijuana was a felony back then. And wow. you, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Have changed, huh? Yeah, oh, a, a seed, wow, if it was capable yeah. of ger germination, was a, a felony. Wow. So, so uh, how yeah. did they justify going into this apartment? Well, the way they justified back then, the way all that was justified, they had probable cause to believe that something was going on. They went in. Okay. I fought that in county court, and they were convicted. And interestingly enough, and <laughs> John Purvis, to his everlasting shame, who's a very fine trial lawyer here in town and was a public defender then and he was the prosecutor and he okay. I and I remember him telling the jury and the judge I, I just remember this sort of vividly up there on the third floor of the building the, the county where it was then the county court and now where the commissioners county commissioners are and I remember him telling the jury and the judge that that um, how they were just you know uh, layabouts up there and um, I'm thinking I remember saying sort of sarcastically to the judge and jury, well, that's, that's pretty good grounds to put someone in jail if they're laying about. <laughs> and um, that, my sarcasm aside, that's what they did. So anyway, we went to federal court. And that is a bigger deal than it may, you know, it, it, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, uh, how um, much time elapsed between this first months. trial? Month, many months? Well, several months, three or four months to get it before a panel, because they had to appoint a panel. We, in, we got a three-judge federal court panel to hear the case. And three-judge federal court panel, there were a total of three district court judges then, U.S. district court judges. And so there was a, <coughs> Judge Breitenstein was the Court of Appeals representative, and then there were two district court judges, uh, Judge Shilson and Judge Doyle. And they Can I interrupt you for a moment? Sure. Let me back up a little bit to the first trial was here in Boulder. Right. And they were found guilty of vagrancy right. and sentenced to 30 days in jail. 30 days in jail. So by the time this federal trial happened, 
they were they, out. They had served their 30 days already, so this was a matter of principle then. You were oh, yeah. Pr get them out of jail or... Well, know. it was a lot of things. It was one, it was people were being arrested all over the state then. I mean, the VW buses were coming in and right. they, yeah. the, the men had, the males had long hair and it was an affront to the to the good citizens, you know. It, they just, um, it, it, it it was difficult for them to deal with this because there was such a change, there was such an uprooted change. It was kind of a, it was a catalyst of, of sorts where something just new and different came in and caused this upheaval. And I'm not saying whether the upheaval ended up being, you know, good or bad. Those things always happen and, and you know, some people say change is good. You can make change a positive, but there was definite change and some of it was I know, personally, I feel very good. But I have to tell you this. Not all of these um, young people coming through were, in fact, most of them were just living a lifestyle of, of I mean, Debauchery. between 17. No, no, I, that isn't fair at all. Between 17 and 22 or 23, they were, they were just living a lifestyle of, of fantasy. And they were having a wonderful time. And I'm saying, good for them, <laughs> you know, they really were. But it was really hard for them to, uh, that is the citizens of Boulder and other places uh, who are very conservative to, to deal with this. I mean, it really was. And I, I have to tell you quickly, my mother, who I mentioned had this small shop up in Estes Park, used to love it. I mean, she was an, it really was an exception in that way, an exceptional woman. I remember her saying, they are having so much fun, look at them. They're having so much fun and they're just upsetting people and they're not doing anything to anybody. This was her attitude, which was really true. I was offended that, I don't know if that's a fair way to put it, but I, the idea of people going to jail because people didn't like them, really, because they weren't liked by the establishment. And the statute was so broad and when the court heard it, that was one of, the, it was overbroad. That is, it, it took in everything. It took in all the conceivable kinds of acts you could do. You could be strolling about. That was, that's in the statute, strolling about. Strolling about. You, wow. could be, um, you could be having no visible means of support. Well, who has a visible means of support? Maybe if you're walking around with a tool belt on. But, I mean, does a banker have a visible means of support if they're, if they're, if they're walking across the street? I mean, so it's, mm -hmm. if the officer doesn't like you, so it gave such power to the authorities. It also was so uh, offensive to individuals uh, that they would come into town, they would buy gas, they would do whatever they were doing. Maybe they'd be panhandling, which was in the statute. Uh, <clears throat> but none of this seemed fairly to be a crime by any stretch. Mm -hmm. And so in the court heard, so the lawsuit was against the city of Boulder that was enforcing it, against the sheriff who was enforcing it, against the which, city manager. Which sheriff was that, um, remember? Yeah, it was, um, I wish you hadn't asked me that. Well, I remember Renner Forbes was net or no, Boulder no, County Renner Forbes was the uh, Forbes was the uh, was the marshal up there. Oh, okay. So that's a and different story. Is, yeah, this, this is, is Boulder, yeah. and he's okay. uh, yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed. Not Kirk know. Long. No, 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 no. no. He, they were all later, and Kirk Long was not the sheriff; he was a deputy. Okay. But okay. that's okay. But you we'll, know who it, it will come to him. <laughs> so what happened is, um, anyway, I brought it against Connect, who was the uh, city manager and also against the mayor and the city attorney brought uh, Walt Wagenhals defended along with the state attorney general. And who was the mayor at that time, remember? Connect. Connect, okay. I, I'm sorry, I said he was the manager. I think ma mayor was Connect. Okay. And was what happened... K-N-E-C-H-T? It's K-N-E-C-H-T. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, so, right. what happened is uh, the assistant attorney general, Oral Kelly, defend. She was pretty good, but what was she going to say? You and know, strolling federal, about. We're back this in federal, okay, federal okay. court. I know I'm flipping around. Let that's me go okay, back. Cool. We were convicted in county court in Boulder, okay. and what happened is were you defending they, for I that defended them. Too? Okay. I defended them in that, 
and not only were they laying about, but they were, and I love this word, lolly, lollygagging lolly was what, gagging. yeah, and that was John Purvis. <laughs> and per, John later became a public defender, so he's not, I don't know, thrilled with this, but he um, accused them of lollygagging. And I remember saying that very sarcastically. He said, well, that's good grounds. They should go to jail for lollygagging around, whatever that means. Right. And, um, and the jury agreed with me. They thought they should go to jail. <laughs> My sarcasm was lost. Uh, maybe not lost, but not appreciated. And, and this was actually a jury trial. Oh, it was a jury trial That's really for vagrancy. And how oh, yeah. many jurors were there? Th there were six. Six jurors yeah. for a big, that's, that's interesting. Oh, yeah, I mean, a, like a mountain out of a molehill, really. It was beyond description. But yeah. they were anxious to clean up. I mean, these people should not have been in this town. They shouldn't right. have been in their town. They shouldn't have been doing these things. And I know I sound right now um, a little sarcastic about it, and it's hard not to be, but you know, uh, that was their life, and uh, who, who am I? I come from a very rural background in a conservative kind of area, mm. and I, I really, I don't want to get into this too personally, but I, I really credit my mother with having instilled the kind of ideal, I, I'm not saying this makes me a good person, I'm just saying that the ideal she instilled in me was that the, the basic premise that of, of the dignity of a person, of an individual, and it doesn't matter who their parents are, who they, where they come from, but, and I was, a, I just thought it shouldn't be, and so I represented them in federal court. Then, then we went, okay, we're convicted, they do their 30 days, and meanwhile I'm in federal court, but that's going to take a while, and we go to federal court, and the jail here was it's not like now where they have, you know, from eight to nine yoga and from, I'm not saying it's a great place, but I mean from, you know, from 10 to 11, they have, you know, interpersonal discussions and it, it was just a class, it was like the 310 to Yuma. I mean, it was just these bars and the lock and, you know, five or six people in there. And I just recall, I, I actually recall this, and probably more than you want to hear, but I'm gonna say it anyway, I remember sitting on one of their bunks while I was talking to them and the jail doctor made the visit and he said to the deputy give them the the purple powder is what he said and then it dawned on me what the purple powder was for lice and such and I was oh. like wait I'm, I'm, I'm out of here <laughs> but anyway, I'd been sitting on the bunk with them it was okay <laughs> but anyways that was the that was the jail that was the jail and, and where was that it was right down where um, it was right on uh, 13th and uh, between Spruce and Pearl, and that's where the that's where the D the DMV was there later, and that was the sheriff's office and the jail combined. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. there's there's three buildings there. There's three county buildings there, and I don't know what it is for now, but the middle one is where the county commissioners meet, and the east one is where the voting and and the anyway. So. They did their 30 days. We were in federal court. They went down with me. I brought them down. They didn't actually have to be there for the argument. We had briefed it. We had done, a, a, a put everything together. And they had been making, they and several others had been making pies in a residence that someone they connected up with. One of the young people in town, their parents were out of town and they were in the house and they were making pies. And Roger Stevens, and as part of his, who was then my partner, his, part of his oral argument to the court, uh, when we were moving, an early on argument pointed out, and he was saying, well, you know, they were making pies, and he said it several times, and finally one of the judges leaned down and said, what does that have to do with this? They were, what, they, they were making pies? He said, well, just that people all over Boulder were making pies at that time, but they happened to be the men with the long hair, the males with the long hair that got arrested. The women with the long hair, they didn't get arrested, which <laughs> was, but, that's interesting. There were women in the house at the same time and they didn't get arrested? Uh, well, yeah, they were actually picked them all up for vagrancy. Okay. But Roger's From point inside was... Inside of a house. That's inside of a amazing. house. But you know, if you're a vagrant, it doesn't matter whether you're inside of a house or not. It's just easier to spot you outside. But you got to understand that the, the, the law was so broad, which is one of the several yeah. grounds upon which they found it unconstitutional. It was overbroad. And it was a denial of due process because you didn't really know what was going, what, what you did to get arrested. How, how can you avoid this? It made status a crime. That is, if you were moving from place to place, it was a crime. Example, 
Um, I, you've told me you can't really hear it, but I've got this sort of sinus cold that came on. Um, you, you could make having a sinus cold a crime. I mean, it was a status. It was, in, in their case, it was... Oh, you don't mean social status, you mean current status. Current status, yes. Oh, interesting. But you could also make social status Weird. if you want. That was a crime. But not, it, it didn't define it that way, but they could pick you up for it. It was used in other states, uh, uh, other places it was used as uh, a part of uh, strike breaking in, in say, mm. in Philadelphia and other larger uh, municipalities back east and in the west coast. But in, in Colorado it was really used just to pick up the, you know, really the flower children and other, uh, if someone came through, it wasn't used really at, as an ethnic um, arrest that I became familiar with. I remember after it was declared unconstitutional, the jail opened up 22, let 22 people go that they were holding uh, on vagrancy. And so what the demographics there were, I don't know. I know in Boulder the demographics really were sort of uh, white, um, I, I'd like to say the lost youth or the lost boys, but really the they didn't have the charm of the Lost Boys out of out of the books and the movies. Uh -huh. They were they were sort but of. Kirkland was what nineteen he or was 19. something at that time, and the other guy was. Goldman Charles? was I th he was older. He was about a year older. Oh, okay, but kids. Oh, they were young people. Yeah, uh, yeah, they were kids, and yeah. uh, and so they were, you know, the life they led was not a was not a profligate life. It really wasn't. They, they were having fun, they were smoking weed, they were drinking wine, whatever they could get. But as these things move, it becomes sort of unattractive at some point, even among the, each other, because fights develop, unpleasantness develops, and the first people coming through with the fancy painted VW vans and the really interesting artwork and the sort of really interesting people on some level um, that began to get old. It wasn't the merry pranksters that Kesey wrote about. It got to be more, um, I, I don't know, for want of a better word, um, unappealing. Or I don't want to say earthy. You mean like say mid '70s by then, or no, the late even '60s? In the Kirkland uh, no, I, I'd say mid '70s is probably a better. Time flies, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the mid '70s is probably. Uh, more accurate. And so when Kirkland and Goldman came down to federal court, and I drove them down, and we, it was fine. And um, Had you sort it of was an argument. friends with them by then? You know, or how, what was the relationship like? I have to tell you this. Because you're a lawyer, which is like the man, right? Were well, you well, I the was, man? Or? I, 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 well, I hate to use that term. <laughs> I, I hate it too. I've never used it before, and Thank I never you. will. Thank I appreciate again. it, and please don't ask me that because if I say yes, it really makes me into something that I don't like to be. Uh, but I will tell you that I, it was back when I was young and, and you know thinking of myself. I mean, I was still riding in rodeos on the side. I mean, it was I was having a, 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 my own life was a, a great life, but I I didn't. I didn't go to their parties, I didn't go up and visit with them in the campground unless there was some witness I was looking for. And I was doing this on my own, really. And I was the only uh, ACLU lawyer in northern Colorado then, now there's a whole thing, but it's become... Well, the, were you officially connected with the ACLU? I, I was, but I'm not sure then what a officially meant. You know, back then well, there was weren't... Was pro bono? There, yeah, oh, it was all pro okay, bono. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I wasn't paid by the ACLU. They just called me up and say, hey, Bob, we heard that there was a something in Fort Collins. And so I'd go up there, but it was all. Um, you were but, but it wasn't. Oh no, I wasn't getting paid. But what 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 did happen was they were. You know the ACLU gradually. And I, this is really not a criticism. It's more of a sort of a critique that they become. Um, you know, become kind of a business. I mean, it's got it's 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 organized, and they have a lot of forms and paperwork and things and so I've sort of gradually left them over a period of time. It was more more work mm. dealing with them than I wanted to do. I just liked being, I liked doing things my own way as my own person. <laughs> that was the end. 
And uh, but what you say, what you were implying, yeah, it, I was, I, I didn't party with him, and, and I that's just sort of a funny way to put it. But I never have seen myself as a better than than others under any circumstances. They were who they were. I was who I was, and I could help them, and that's the way I saw it. But I got to tell you, they were, they could be difficult, and they would, you know, show up stoned, and I had to deal it's with that. Nice they would stuff, show up yes. kind of half crazed, and I had to deal with that. And uh, you know, that was, I had another life that I wasn't gonna, and so. It was exciting times. I was doing what I thought was right. And I got to tell you this, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. Uh -huh. Interesting cases. Oh yeah, it was really interesting. So, okay, so <clears throat> let's see. Okay, we, let's back up again. We drove, you were driving the um, Kirkland and Goldman down for the to hearings. this courthouse. For the hearings. How many hearings were there? Uh, my recollection is there were two. Okay. And. But I remember so many little vignettes that I'm wondering if I want to hear the vignettes. Don't well, me. Uh, this you're not going to like that. I mean, Walt Wagenhaus was a really good guy. He was the city attorney, but he was overmatched. And I'm not trying to say because of me. Oh, I've got to say also, Morgan Smith was a, a public defender then in in, uh, in Brighton, and he had joined in as well. Joined in on your side. On my side, okay. yeah. And so, uh, Walt. You know, the city attorney's office then was very small, and it was Walt prosecuted as well as he was the city attorney, so he did all the city council meetings, the city corporate business, and then, but anyway, I remember him saying to the judge, I, I don't know the procedure in federal court. Now, Oral Kelly was there, and she was from the attorney general's office against us, and she was very, very good. Oral, how do you spell Oral? Uh, A-U-R-E-L, I believe. A-U-R-E-L. I Kelly. believe. Okay. Kelly. And so what happened is, I remember this, and it was, it sounds like a slam, and I don't mean it that way, it was just, it, Walt stood up and he said, you know, I, I'm not sure of the procedure in federal court. And I had been a federal court law clerk for a year, so I knew, but I sort of thought there's something you would know anyway, but it was all right. And so he said, and the, I'm not sure how I do this, and the, the judge said, well, <laughs> Mr. Wagonals, you'll put on, Mr. Miller will put on any evidence he has, and then you will put on any evidence you have, and then I'll rule. <laughs> and Walt was like, oh. right. You know, it was, it was sort of like, it was, it was a sort of, it was a moment. Well, no, it wasn't. It was just, it was the way he was. He was a very stern, wonderful man, wonderful judge. Uh, you know, you could Which say. Which judge was that? Uh, this was Judge Hatfield Chilson. Chil Chilson? C H I L S O N. S O N, okay. And a, a wonderful, wonderful man. But he, he uh, was just kind of sounded stern. And he was stern on the bench. He had a very powerful countenance. He had come from the steel mills in, in Pueblo and gone to see you on a, on a scholarship, a football scholarship, which he it was a walk-on, what they called it. He, he had two shoes, one didn't fit, and kind of, and then he became a huge star and became, um, and then he, he played all the sports, which they did back then, and then he went on to law school and then went, anyway. So he was one of the three judges. There, this, uh, and this, you and, I forgot, the, the city guy. Walt Wagonalls, but Wagon Oral Kelly Alls. really did it. He he didn't do much. Okay. It was Oral Kelly. But you're the same two who argued it in the Boulder County Court. No, um, no. The district attorney was from Boulder County District Attorney was the one that argued against me. Oh. Walt was from the city, and the, the city, city really Boulder. yeah. And there's sort of I'm not going to get into it because yeah, it'll take forever. But yeah. but the the inner the internecine actions here. Walt Wagonalls with the city, and the county of Boulder is part of the state. They prosecute state laws. And the vagrancy oh. statute was a state statute that encompassed the okay. entire state. The city had various loitering and panhandling ordinances, which I took on later, and sitting on the sidewalk and walking your dog on 
and walking on the wrong side. All of which people got arrested for, by the way. Back for then. walking your dog? Well, uh, not on a leash. Not being oh. on a leash or... Uh, they, they would look for anything to arrest someone for. And so, the, anyway. What happened is that Oral Kelly sort of prosecuted, had to defend the state statute. The in federal court, because I had sued Mr. Wag the city, Mr. Wagonels was down there representing the city. Okay. Bec and I sued the city okay. because the city police were enforcing it as well. And I sued the sheriff. County sheriff. The county, county sheriff, sheriff here, okay. and I can picture him perfectly. But and you can't remember he, his name. He was, kind I can of, he was a that. nice guy, actually, on a more personal level. It'll, it'll hit me. But anyway, <laughs> he was... He, but anyway, the, the county was represented by, okay. the, by the, the state attorney general. And so I'd actually be interested in knowing what her defense was for these, what seemed like ridiculous, perhaps just today it seemed ridiculous, but you, do, you have, do you remember any of that, of what her arguments were? I remember her struggling. Yeah. <laughs> she was, she was <laughs> struggling that. mightily. And I will tell you, at the end of the, of, of, of the hearing, and the judges were going to then render an opinion, and I never this cocky ever, ever, ever. And, but I, re, I can't believe I did this uh, because I would never. But I, re, I remember going up to her as we were leaving, and she was fine. And I said, "Oral, you and I know how this is going to come out, and I'm I'm pleading with you to please appeal it to because the appeal from a three judge federal court was up to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, and I wanted to be first up there." And then this would have thrown out all the vagrancy statues in the country. And so I said, you know, I'm, 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 and by the way, I said, don't be caught strolling back to your office there at the Attorney General's <laughs> office. Ooh. Yeah, and she, she laughed. She was fine. And actually, and I, I will get ahead again, but when, when we won and the decision came down, which was a long decision, it was like 35 pages or it's more. It's online. I found yeah. it online, yeah. And she, and um, the, she, they, she didn't, they didn't appeal it. They didn't take it up uh, because it was, it, it, at that point, hopeless. things had changed. I mean, the whole, uh, I mean, the social fabric was changing. Uh, the, the, the Supreme Court, whatever conservative they were or were not at that point, is just becoming more liberal. They were not going to back this, they, they weren't going to back this statute, which was, I mean, it came out of old England. It was, you can't be strolling about. I mean, yeah, a lollygagging <laughs> around. I mean, it, I don't think lollygagging's actually in it, but <laughs> that was that was John Purvis's version. Um, I will tell you that um, Purvis. I have to say this because I'm in. Purvis was a brilliant lawyer, and when he was a public defender, after this was the public defender's office, he did major work there, defending people. In any event. I will tell you one other vignette if you want to hear it from the, yeah. the trial. I remember this here, this part of the hearing. Well, the, the, it was a big hearing, and uh, hey, ju you Justice mean Breitenstein. Big audience or what? No, there wasn't that big an audience. It really was not exciting it wasn't to like anybody. A galley full no. of you know street people. No, or? I'll tell you about one of those later if you really want to hear. Yeah. But <laughs> it was a different issue. It was, but anyway, what happened is that. I was, of course, nervous. I was living in a little house down on, uh, just off of, just off of Arapaho in what's now Folsom, and the lights didn't always work. And I remember I got dressed. I had a suit, a suit, and it was like a pinstripe suit, and I put it on and I went down there, and the lights didn't work. And I went down there, and um, I, I knew. And I ran into Morgan Smith in the hallway as we were down in federal court, and he said, "Would you get dressed in the dark?" I said, "I did." <laughs> and he, I looked down, and I had a, 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 you know, a light brown coat and this pinstripe pants. And Justice Breitenstein was really a tough guy, and he'd been known to send lawyers quote home to get dressed unquote if they weren't wearing a suit in the argument. And he was from the Court of Appeals, which is right under the U.S. Supreme Court. The Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit encompasses many states. What happened is, I, and I, I ran into a law clerk uh, who I knew, 
for Judge Shulson. And I was telling him, I said, can you imagine? And he did what I'd sort of hoped he did. And he went back there and was talking to the judges. And they came out laughing. So, so I was well, okay. No, okay, I missed something. What? I dressed improperly. So you had a brown coat with a blue... Pinstripe. I'm not oh, okay. much of you can tell. I'm not much of a thing. <laughs> but anyway, but here's, here's, the, here's the story. I called Roger Stevens. And I said, Roger, you got to get down here and bring my suit jacket. So he crawled through the window of the house and went into my closet and got my suit jacket and brought it down. And I started my argument to the judges. And I heard this tss from the back. And Roger's holding up this suit coat <laughs> in the courtroom and saying, I got it for you. And I said, that's okay. Did you stop and No, go? I didn't. I kept going. It was okay. They, the judges were fine with me. I thought they were going to be. You don't know about that. It was, that yeah, was, thing they want they the could, oh, particularly in federal court. So, Do you anyway. mind if I ask how old were you at that time? No, you happened? can ask, and I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to remember. I think I was um, 27. Okay. Young. Yeah. Yeah. And so, anyway, and the decision came down, and the judge found... And how much time elapses between this argument, arguing... A couple of months, actually. Months, I think okay. it was about a month and a half. They, they had worked on this very hard. They, if, it, if it was appealed... They wanted it to look right, and so they they, they, they the worked judges. it out. The judges yeah, okay. and they and it wasn't their only case on the docket, but they knew it was going to be a big case if it went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And wouldn't it go to the Colorado Supreme Court? No, first, no, no, no. This is federal. The Colorado Supreme Court okay, had nothing so, okay, to do with so it. Okay, so you're already in federal. All right, we're in federal court. We bypassed the Colorado Supreme okay. Court, and that took okay. some doing. Okay, to, so, to oh, so you deliberately wanted to get it to the federal instance. court. So was that your decision to skip the Colorado Supreme yes. Court? Yes. Okay. But what was your it, logic behind it? That? It was going to take longer. It was going to be, I felt we would, we would have a quicker and maybe a better hearing with the, with the federal court. And okay. anyway, I, okay, so there may have been other reasons, but I'm not recalling them exactly. Yeah. Mainly, I thought I'd get a quicker hearing, Sounds which like I did get. Anyway. Well, I, I moved for a, a pr preliminary injunction, and I asked to, for a permanent injunction, and all of that was going to take up to a year longer to get in front of the Colorado Supreme Court. So it, I, I could get this through the federal court. And did these did um, Kirkland and Goldman have to testify, or, or was it just two <clears throat> lawyers arguing in front of the judges? I put on. I asked. I called them as witnesses, and the judges really didn't want to hear from them. They wanted to hear the, 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 it was the law any good. And I said, well, they're afraid. This leaves them in fear of being arrested. And that was my motion for the injunction. It's one thing to have the law declared unconstitutional or something else, to enjoin the immediate enforcement of it. The, the court, if you read between the lines, did not issue an injunction. But they said, if you read between the lines, they were saying, I, I don't think you're going to be so stupid as to try and, and, and enforce a law that we've declared unconstitutional. <laughs> I.e., you know, I could come back if I had to. They weren't going to do that. Uh -huh. and so, so did they testify? They did very briefly. Very it, briefly. Uh, yeah, I know I called them and the judges cut me off. So oh. I'm trying to remember if I got beyond the swearing in or not. Because so they really were they weren't. like scraggly? Yeah, they, they were they who they were. Dressed up in suits oh, no, 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 no. No, I, I, I had to look right, but they didn't. Okay. They, they looked right for them, which was fine. Right, which is yeah, who they are. Fine. So. But I'm going to tell you this. I know you would like. We've talked a little bit off camera, and I know you would like sort of interesting, amusing stories about them. But like I told you, you know, they weren't the merry pranksters in the in in the Ken Kesey novel. Mm -hmm. They were not interesting in themselves. I, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that made them Even lesser the people. Would say that. Both of them. I'm not. I, I'm not putting them down. I'm not saying they weren't unique people. You know, they were not, um, say, for example, um, freedom writers who were heroic people. Mm -hmm. And what they did is a different story. The, right. the, the, the freedom writers, and I know some of them, and th what they did was to challenge the law, and they did it deliberately and intentionally, and they did it for very, very good purposes. And those were heroic people. Yeah. Uh, what they did was heroic. I, I, you know, Kirkland and and Goldman were just in the in the wrong place at the wrong time, and you know, and victims of of an awful statute that shouldn't have been there. And 
they weren't taken to, you know, to jail in Alabama and beat up. They were put in Boulder County Jail, and they weren't, you know, it wasn't a very pleasant place. I already sort of yeah. sarcastically, yeah. I know, made comments. But that's how it was back then. I mean, I'm not saying that it should have been better. Everything in its time, if you take it in the context of how it was then, they weren't treated any better or any worse than anybody else once they were in jail. And the treatment wasn't that good, but it wasn't what you would have gotten as a freedom rider in Alabama. So, yeah. and some of those people I know, so I know how it went. Um, so they were arrested, they were put in there, they got their meals. It wasn't a very pleasant place, but not awful. And then after 30 days, they were gone. And then, you know, they were subject to rearrest. They were walking down the street again. <laughs> And, um, and I'm, I, I know they did get rearrested for other various yeah. flag desecration. Right. And I'm not going to, I really don't want to go there. I didn't represent them on the flag desecration, yeah. and that was a different issues and different times and different people. Um, th you know, that was more of an intentional act on their part. And I'm not saying that they couldn't make an intentional act, and if it's a challenge to freedom of speech and someone's doing that, that's their challenge and that's what they're doing. Right. I look at that differently than I look at being a freedom rider, and I also look at it differently than I do about being at the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, getting arrested for, for, for being a vagrant is, that's status. I mean, that's poor people. Um, it, it was used to harass poor people, not so much in Boulder because, you know, if you were, I mean, but it, it was really sort of the long hair youth that they were arresting. And they were such an affront to the to the establishment, and they just were. Uh, it's hard to set the scene about how it was then. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it, the the people were wrong that were here. It was a different time, and uprooting them in that way was a really tough time for them. And who is to say that they would not have been the same way back in that time? because it was a different time, a different period. The Vietnam War was just heating up and, and, and they were starting to bomb in Cambodia. Things were starting to happen in a very ugly way over there. It coalesced into an anti-war kind of thing, but it didn't start out that way. Mm. It just started out with, with people being free spirits, and they really were, and not, uh, you know, not inappropriately in my eyes. I mean, they were smoking weed and, and drinking wine. I mean, it's pretty hard to say yeah. that made them criminal, but it did. Yeah. And under the law, and, and, and if they could arrest, I mean, that was a felony. They go through the campground, the police, and oh, we smelled weed, that's enough. And they'd start going through backpacks wow. and all wow, sorts of stuff. Then. Oh, yeah. Wow. Po oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a lot of arrests coming down on that, in jail, and it was an affront to the establishment. And my representing them was an affront to the establishment on some level. Yeah, I wanted and to ask you And yeah, that. I knew you did, but uh, it, was, uh, it was sort of different in one way, and that is I didn't care. I mean, I really didn't care. And being an affront to people in general has always been sort of just fine with me. <laughs> and being an affront to the establishment yeah. then was just fine. So, okay, so um, you won your case. I did. And what happened to the statute? Is it just vacated or whatever the word declared is? Declared unconstitutional. Declared Can't unconstitutional. be used. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a, so it's just a footnote in history. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's of interesting. No, and Do you know how long that had been a statute here in Colorado? Oh, yeah, from the beginning. From, from the, the very uh, origin oh, of yeah, the state. The, I, I hate to say the origin of the state, but from an early legislature it was. And then Boulder had its own city municipal ordinances that sort of tracked them, tracked the vagrancy statute, which was, um, you know, pretty well encompassed everything. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't stroll. That was a word in it. You couldn't be uh, without visible means of support, which was a phrase it used. Yeah, um, you that. couldn't be panhandling, which is, there's some argument about, I'm not going to go there about my feelings on that. It's just, you know, they're, they're leaving, leave those people alone if they're not. And and so, and you, and, and you said after this case you went to work on the Boulder Ordinance. Yeah, then they, people got arrested, uh, uh, you know. Other, other like issues. STP family people? STP or, or other, you know, uh, they weren't all STPers. 
SCP family was kind of a, a loose. Yeah. It wasn't like a fraternity <laughs> up right. at the university. They didn't have club meetings. They didn't have club meetings and secret handshakes. I'll tell you, and <laughs> called each other brother. But they. <laughs> I don't think anyone really knew what SCP meant anyway. Well, I, I'm not going to go there. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's all right. But. Um, well, how did this other case come about? Then the Boulder. Oh one? yeah, this, uh, they got. Uh, uh, it wasn't them, but some other uh, uh, sort of some. Um, for lack of a more, you know, precise definition, you'll see some flower children got arrested, um, sitting on the sidewalk up on the hill, and the hill at that time at the university was a very conservative area. It was fraternity, it was sorority, it was CU, which was very conservative. And keep in mind, this was a period of time. I mean, they had Pearl Street was a street, yeah, and. Um, you know, they still had the the rodeo parade through there with horses and floats, and the powwow rodeo down here at, uh, was where the YMCA is now on 28th yeah, was a very very, very major rodeo, and um, it was still it was kind of rural in the area and conservative, the town the, the this town of Boulder and the city of Boulder, and you know the CU was much smaller. I mean, it's 8,500 8, people when I was there. Uh -huh. And so it was a much smaller city. And the hill, and I understand those merchants up there. I mean, I'm not saying they, they were awful people. And th this was their, not only their way of life, but it's the way they looked at the world. Many of them were World War II vets or Korean War vets. And people were, it was still a conservative time in America. And so it was, it was a catalyst which these people coming through, which, as you probably know, maybe you would agree, maybe not, but I think you would, that it, it brings about change. It's, I don't want to, I want to get into a Marx theory here, but the, there's a synthesis out of this that eventually it turns into something else. And I would th say that it happens, changed the whole character of Boulder. Uh, well, it happens, you know, as you well know, in the physical sciences. It also happens in the social sciences, and it, it changed the character of Boulder. But it brought out, uh, well, the character of Boulder has changed a lot just because it's, it, it's natural, you know, beauty and what, what's there. And so you get the, the big city folks from the east and west coast move here. And, it, you know, it, it, it's changed for a lot of reasons. But it all started, I think, I mean, it, I shouldn't say it all started, but it, it, it really... Um, when when the, the 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 hippie slash flower children came through, it really created an, up, an upheaval. Yeah. And there were I, you mentioned earlier Bob McFarland, the doctor, and he was a stalwart in that time. And he looked after a lot of these people, and he started the free clinic up here. Mm -hmm. And he uh, he and I were good friends, and he was um, he was a very decent man. And he, he really fought for the, fought for these people, in a, in a, and did a lot of positive things and made a lot of positive um, changes for them. So, anyway. Yeah, he mentioned he, there is an oral history with McFarland at this same collection. I, I think there's a couple of them actually. He actually mentions you, in one of them in relation to John Kirkland. He talks about. SCP John, John Kirkland, he rather venerates him. It was very interesting. He just, he introduces him. There's this wonderful young man who, named John Kirkland, who came to town and helped, um, you know, do benefits for the People's Clinic. And, and uh, I don't think that Bob Miller appreciated him. He actually he says said something that. like that. I was yeah. just going to say, when you said Bob Miller, when you said there's this wonderful young man, I was sort of hoping you'd say Bob Miller. <laughs> no, he's talking about Kirkland. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. That's really interesting. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen any of those oral history, which I will. Now. Yeah, it's yeah. actually recording. They weren't uh, videotaping. Uh -huh. Well, but I got to say, I, I, well, he and I had a lot of talks, Bob McFarland and I, and I, I don't want to go there because that's, you know, off in another world and yeah. we, we don't have, I really put you to sleep then, but he and I had a lot of talks, but I made it, I, I told him, I, I, no, I did not appreciate John Kirkland on the level that, that, that Bob McFarland did. And because... Bob McFarlane really, really, I think, liked him. And I didn't like or dislike. I mean, he was someone that I thought had, had some really positive traits, but he had a lot of negative traits, too. I mean, some really unpleasant traits. I'm not going to get into. 
But there was a side of violence and anger with him that that Bob McFarland always overlooked in people. I used to accuse him. I tell him this. And just as you say, he said, you know, Bob Miller never appreciated him. I'll tell you, John McFar or Bob McFarland had way too much for him than, than he should have. Let me slam him now. Uh, but, yeah, but Bob McFarland didn't care about negative traits with people. And I'd like to say that I didn't care either, but I did. And, but I was real busy. I didn't spend my life, uh, I, I did, with the law. I mean, I was putting 15, 16-hour days. But at the same time, at, if I wasn't working, helping them out or going to the jail or doing something of that nature, I really went on my own way. No, and you must Bob, have had, like had normal had cases them. where you actually had an income and all that. I had you to, wasn't I had all to, pro bono. You know, I had to pay for my stationery and I had to pay for <laughs> yeah. the lights. and I mean, I had to pay for these things. And but my impression was that you did do quite a bit of pro bono work. You, um, I did. There I did. was a lot of cases where you actually represented a lot of different SCP I family did. members. and I did do that. And I did it because I thought that they were just being harassed unfairly and improperly. And so, I mean, they would call me and say, so-and-so's in jail. And I'd say, I'll go down and see him. And I'd go down and we'd talk. And I'd say, this is terrible. I, I, I'm, it's like, I, I, I don't like the way this sounds because I'm not trying. Anyway, I, I, but I, would, I wasn't going to stand for it. I, I, I'm trying to think of a less self, uh -huh. a, a, a less self-aggrandizing <laughs> way of saying it, but I wasn't going to stand for it. I wasn't going to stand for these people just getting abused that way. So I'd go back. I'd put on a tie and coat. At <laughs> this time, hopefully something uh -huh. that matched better. And I, I didn't care in district court here, and uh, and, I'd re and I'd be going. Now, yeah. Were you the only attorney in town at that time who would take on these? I'm sure they were like the cases that nobody wanted. Were you the only one? I know there was somebody else who represented them for that fat flag desecration. By then, the ACLU had gotten more active. And there were some others, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I can't, but really, the, no one was actively doing it. And one I remember uh, from Longmont who, who, who represented a, one of the professors who'd been fired for inciting a riot, and he represented them on a professor? Yeah, I'm not going to go there right now. But he, anyway, he uh, came in as an ACLU representative. And I, I used the ACLU as a, kind of as a way in. I was sort of a, it was a cart that I would come in on. Uh, but <laughs> it was a very loose organization. I would go down to meetings in Denver occasionally when they had them. I will tell you a briefly amusing story if you want to hear this. Um, Walt Garash, it, it, it was a lion. I mean, just a lion from the, you know, the old labor days, and and he. <laughs> G a r a s a. Yeah, and Walt was much older than I, and. Was he an ACLU a, a, lawyer? He did some ACLU, and he was also a. a one of you know one of the lawyers that had been accused of I mean the group as a group had been accused of being you know left leaning communist but back before I was a lawyer when they were defending the the defending the professors who were forced to take the oath and that kind of thing and I'm without I, I know we weren't going to get into that yeah, and I'm not that. yeah, okay, yeah the 50s and stuff yeah. and that was well before me but what happened is I remember being in a meeting and. They were saying, well, if someone gets thrown off a plane because they got long hair, we're going to definitely take it on. And we said, absolutely, we're going to take it on. And then someone said, well, what about smelling really bad? <laughs> and, and Walt said, I'll never forget this, Walt would take on any cause and any issue at the drop of a hat. And he also was a well-known trial lawyer and you know took a lot of big cases and, and won some big verdicts and, and also did some big criminal cases where he was you know, representing some pretty well healed people. And so um, was and, and some said, what if they smell really bad? And Walt said, well, I remember him, he stood up and said, if they're smelling bad, I'm kicking them off the plane myself. You know, I, I'm not sitting next to them. And that was the end of it. The ACLU decided, okay, well, we're not going to represent someone. That's how it was. But that's how the meetings were. And now I know they're much more bureaucratic, and that doesn't make them a bad organization. It's just the way it's become. Yeah, it's just. And, and and that's what's happened. The changes, you know, I don't know the. 
you know, they've done a lot of, there have been a lot of books and things written about, you know, what the, the old hippie types that, you know, some of them are, are you know, growing, growing lettuce up in Oregon and, and some of them are stockbrokers in New York. And I'm, you know, I, we're not going to go there, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, but I, I, I had no interest in being best friends. Uh, but really, uh, you know, my clients are that way. I mean, th whether they're, they're doctors or bankers or whether they're uh, other people that I know, I don't, I don't socialize them with them, for not for any reason other than I'm really busy. I mean, I have a really, really active, busy life. And I really, I'm, I'm in the office for long hours. And outside of the office, I have other activities. I have sports and my own sports. I did used to have my children's sports. I had a lot of stuff going on. And I just didn't, you know, I did my own yeah. thing <laughs> after that. But I really didn't like what was going on with the law at that time. And I was, I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the fights. I mean, but I also was very offended by the way they were being treated. Eventually, would you want to get to eventually? Well, let's break here. We've got to change the battery. So this is a good break point. This is tape two of our interview with Robert Bruce Miller, attorney. <laughs> and the date is July 11th, 2013. And my name is Carol Turner. And we've been talking about the Colorado vagrancy statute for the last hour or so. And we're going to read that right now or kind of get the gist of it down anyway. Let me give you the, the gist. Statute. Yeah. yeah I'm, uh, you know, the, the law itself, it, it, we talked about it's old England. And if you went to France, you'd find old France. And if you went to Poland, right. you'd find okay. old Poland. As a, anyway, Poland was not subdivided back then. Any person able to work and support himself in some honest and respectable calling who shall be found loitering. I mean, imagine all these words and definitions. And who shall be found loitering? strolling about, frequenting public places. I mean, what does that make sense? You should, go, you should go to jail for frequenting a public, public place. I mean, this is crazy. Or where liquor is sold. I mean, OK. Um, begging, uh, leading a profligate life, uh, being an idle person, immoral, or not having any visible means of support. That's the essence of it. I mean, yeah, that's and that's 30 days in jail and a fine. That's really good. And Is so, there a name, like a statute number C? One you know one what? Two I two can three? give you that, but I don't have yeah, it. Okay, I used to know it pretty well. Uh, anyway. And so what year was that got uh, thrown out? Would that be 68 or 69? 68 or 69. Yeah. yeah, I, I kind of wonder, you probably don't know this, but if other states have similar stuff oh, they had still identical. there? No, they've all been knocked out, I think. Oh, okay. I'd be very surprised if, if it existed any place now in, in, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, they, because this was used as a basis for other cases, but there were other cases on their way up. And I was in communication with other lawyers who were fighting this. And there was one in Hawaii, I know. And um, they were... It was all kind of coming to a head. They were all coming to a head. I was selfishly trying to be first up to the Supremes, oh. but that didn't happen. Did you? Oh, you didn't Oral Kelly that. wouldn't take it up, so that was the end of that. Oh. We talked about that. So, Did it actually go to the Supreme Court? Eventually some one case? did, yeah. Oh, yeah, they did. Oh. And that was several years later. And okay. uh, you know, But there were a lot of sort of similarities or collateral kinds of things that were going up where the courts were saying, this is a crime of status, we're not going to permit this. Or this is so broad that it encompasses everything. In other words, as you heard that, as you heard that statute read, imagine trying to figure out what it is you would do if you were to be a person that they didn't like, the establishment didn't like, what, what it would be to, to avoid getting arrested for something. Well, I can't be strolling about. <laughs> I got to have visible means of support. I got to show you an artist. I can't frequent a public place. I mean, yeah. you know, all of these various, uh, any one of these. And so it was way overbroad. And, and it was also, uh, as 
well, it was so easy to selectively enforce because the real, actually, if you want to narrow it all down to one, because and that's hard to do and probably not fair, it meant that anyone in authority could arrest anyone for anything. And it gave them all the authority and power in the world you can imagine. And, they, and that's what happened. They were using, the police were using that. The sheriff was using that. And so. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, so the, our last kind of broad question, as we discussed, is kind of what, what were the repercussions for you? Where, where did you end up in your standing in the community with your relationship with the police and the courts? And Well, yeah, that was always sort of interesting. I mean, at the time, I wasn't thinking it was interesting, but I was fighting with everybody. And I was okay with that. I mean, actually, I guess on some level I liked it. And I don't think that made me good or bad. I mean, I just think that, but that's who I was, and I think it made it easier for me to do the kind of law I did. And I was trying a lot of cases, uh, marijuana cases, drug cases, and I was winning. And no one had tried those in years and years and years because it was a slam dunk loser. And it was very rural. Uh, the Boulder County was very rural. The legislature was very conservative. And how would you win? I mean, if well, marijuana was a felony, how could you? Well, just because it's a felony and just because it's, <laughs> it doesn't mean you can't win. And um, what happened is um, that times have gradually kind of changed a little. And I can't say what happened in terms of people's minds, but I know that I had very conservative rural people on juries. And if, the, if they didn't prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, they'd find my client not guilty. And uh, you know, they had to have possession of it. Just because it was in the pack with three other people sitting around, it didn't mean A, B, and C all had. They had to tie it into somebody. I won some appeals to the Colorado Supreme Court, and they, uh, I won several of them where they overturned decisions where I was convicted, my client, and then I represented some clients. Um, and, I, and I was winning trials. And so the legal community was kind of taking notice, number one. And number two, I didn't care if the judges liked me or didn't like me. They gradually sort of came to accept me. There were a couple of lawyers. I was really on the outs with the bar. I wore Levi's in a t-shirt wherever I was going. I was either at the gym or I was out with my horses or I was in, at work. That's what I was my whole life. And they were doing their two and three martinis at lunch. I mean, this was the Bar Association back then. And they were all ties and coats, if it wasn't. It was all silk ties. And I was a t-shirt. And there were two uh, lawyers, actually. There was Neil King, who was a really nice guy and sort of a stalwart in the bar. I mean, he was a, and, and he, and Jim Buchanan was another one who, and they were sort of in between the very conservative and and myself. And then there were some other young lawyers coming to town, some other lawyers doing things, and uh, they sort of came to a conclusion. I think Jim Buchanan actually went to the bar and said, if we don't bring Miller in, he's going to start his own organization. What he, he said to them. I mean, I hope that doesn't sound boastful. No, organization. Well, he just meant, I mean, as a throwaway, that I'd start my own bar or something. It, it wasn't. Oh. It wasn't. And anyway, I, so he got me to some meetings. And then after I won that case, and then I did some environmental cases, which we're not going to go because that's going to take forever. I, I, was, uh, I gave talks to Rotary and to the various Optimist Club, and the various clubs invited me. And I, I told them about oh, it. That's and I, yeah, and I was invited to various organizations. I started talking to the, I'd, done, I'd worked with the Park Service and the Forest Service both when I, before I was a lawyer, when I, I dug I did trails and uh, fought fires, and, and so I had some connects there, and they were inviting me up to various um, meetings where I was giving talks on law on, on the rights of individuals and how they should be treated with some respect. And I, I was a regular up at uh, Grand Teton and um, at the Crater Lake, and various, you know, even went up to Denali. Yeah. So. Anyway, 
I, I, eventually the bar accepted me. When I say a t-shirt, I always kept a change of clothes in my office so I could, I could go to court in a moment's notice. And I was right across the street from the courthouse, so it was easy. No, I'm confused. What do you mean the bar accepted? You have to pass a bar exam to be. Oh yeah, a lawyer, but there's right? a, there's a group of lawyers but in then the bar there's association. This sort of social. Yeah, it's it's a sort of a gigantic fraternity, yeah, sorority okay. now, sorority fraternity. And they shunned you at first, but then. I think that's a good word. <laughs> they did actually. Some of them were really angry at me, and I, I, it leads to another story that I'm not going to go into now. There's just a great story, but with Jim Buchanan, oh. and he reminded me of it. Well, it's. It includes language, which I can't. I don't know whether to, we're not going to do that. So we're, we're okay uh, with it. <laughs> well, okay. So I had this this uh, my my secretary then, who's now a lawyer, by the way. She she uh, got me a stamp for my birthday, and it was a a stamp in a in a red pad to put it in. And now I, I'm, I'm okay. Here okay. it goes. I mean, so it said in big letters, "Fuck you." <laughs> And under it, it said, from Robert Bruce Miller. And I got a real, you know, one of these lawyer letters from some, from a silk stocking firm here. It later became, and they, they, they it, the, the firm has morphed into other better people, but one of them had, was a senior member of the bar and well respected. Silk and it was, stocking firm? What well, that that's mean? what just what it sounds like. Silk tie, silk stocking, fancy. Oh, they made, you, they imagine made. It. You, you can figure it out. You, I know you'll figure it out, but let me tell the story, okay? okay. Right. Thank you. And so what happened is, uh, you insisted on the story, so now you're going to get it. So let me tell my story. Thank you. And uh, what happened is that they um, sent me the letter, and I, I don't remember what it was, just nasty. So I took the stamp as the thing, and I just stamped it and sent it back to him. Fuck you, from Robert Bruce Miller. And he took it to Jim Buchanan, who was then president of the bar, and said, I want him grieve. Or he was uh, president of the bar. He was, he was on the grievance committee. I said, I'm going to grieve Miller for this. And Buchanan, and this has been told many times by different people because he's in the meeting, and Buchanan just burst out laughing. He said, i got to find out where he got that. This is so good. I'm going to get this. This is wonderful. And uh, Hutchison never spoke to him again, or about two years before he spoke to him again, because it was that, and that broke the ice. The ice was also broken in other ways. I'd sued the city several times, I'd sued some police officers several times, and they got together. The police officers then had a union, formed a union, they said, how are we going to get Miller off our back? He said, let's hire him. So they came to me, several of the officers came to me and said, would I represent the union? The police union, wow. and that was in a fight with, not a fight, but a, against, you know, in their their pay and their and 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 their health benefits and things, and they'd come to me over that. Well, I, it was a compliment in the sense that they had been my opponents, if you want to call it that, and I was, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I, I mean, I favor good law enforcement. I, it wasn't, I'm not mm -hmm. fighting, you know, I'm not going to fight that all the time. I mean, I want them to, to, to write good warrants and to get legitimate people for affidavits and not, and not make things up, you know? And I was, so I was, um, I said, yeah, I would. And so that, I think, raised, raised some eyebrows. Don't ask me what that means. You can imagine. I know <laughs> what that means. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that raised some eyebrows. I'm teasing you. I'm, I'm teasing because I, I, I was feeling a little guilty over t talking about that stamp, that rubber stamp. But anyway, it was, it was good. And so anyway, uh, I still have it, but I don't use it very often. Uh, anyways, um, so representing the police was a lot of fun. And I really enjoyed it. Were you surprised when they approached you? I really you? was surprised. Because you must have faced off I against faced them in court off all many the time. times and I hadn't been particularly pleasant. And uh, I was surprised and I was pleased actually. And uh, they had a great uh, and they always had a great Christmas party. I loved going to that. I never socialized with anybody ever. Uh, I shouldn't say any ever, but not very frequently, but I loved their Christmas party and they had a country western band of of police from around the, you know, sheriff's deputies from around that was the police band and it was just a lot of fun and I really enjoyed working with them and then doing that same sort of work with the park service because um, they were enforcing laws and uh, talking to them about 
treating people with subdignity, and just because you're arresting them doesn't mean they're bad people innately. You can treat them with some respect. And I think the, the feedback I got from them was always very positive, because after those lectures, you know, the, the people who set it up, you know how they, they get critiques, and wh who did you like, and what speakers were good, and how did it go. Mm -hmm. And I always got very, very positive feedback. And so I, I really liked doing that. I, I don't mean because I was a good speaker, but because I think it was good that someone told them these things, which they weren't hearing. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting the sense that this was kind of a new idea it was. that, you know, this sort of human dignity or right. human rights kind of attitude well, was really quite new then. Well, it, it was new. T I mean, it, it had to be enforced. It had to be put on to law enforcement in a sense that they could be told, people could be told that, hey, you know, you can arrest someone, you don't have to put them down. And I liked doing that. Uh, I liked giving those talks. And I got a lot of respect from the uh, Kiwanis and the uh, Rotary Club when I talked to them about what was going on. And, and because there were these changes. I mean, it was a huge upheaval. And the, um, we talked about it, I don't want to keep harping on it, but it really was the, the, the early VWs coming through with a really beautiful artwork morphed into something less pleasant. And I know that Bob McFarland and I thought about this, but I will tell you that the STV family was not a group of, of merry pranksters. They could be a real rough group, and they were rough with each other. And um, A lot of them didn't live very long. That's true. They didn't live very long. And that, uh, I was really sorry when one of them passed. I, I really truly John, was. you mean? Any of them. Oh. Any of them. Yeah. And we talked about several earlier. Yeah. And, and, or one would disappear and you'd say, what happened? And say, I don't know. But that did happen. And there were some really, some really awful stories. And um, I didn't like being, I, I, I just didn't like, it was a difficult, that was a difficult part of that time because on the one hand, there was a lot of fun. They were having a lot of fun. There's a lot mm -hmm. of good things going on. There was huge upheaval and I was in the middle of that. It was going on. And then some really unpleasant, to put it nicely, very unpleasant things yeah. would happen. And do you remember the deputy dog? I do remember, I do remember deputy dog well and I remember when he disappeared. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Or, or we talked over each other there for a minute. Did you finish? Yeah, yeah, no, I was just... I do remember Deputy Dog, and I do remember when he disappeared. And I had my suspicions, along with everybody else. And Did people suspect Renner Force? Oh, there were a lot of people that really disliked him and really were suspicious. But disliking and being suspicious were different things, or having other evidence. But uh, he was an awful person, just an awful person. And uh, abusing those kids up there was what he did. And I had several cases uh, with up there in, in Netherland yeah. where I was representing people who, uh, STP type. And uh, you know, it was, always, it was always good. I mean, I, they would call me or they would come to see me and they needed help and I was always happy to help them. But I didn't go up there and hang out with them and, and smoke weed. I mean, that wasn't yeah. what I was going to do. And as I know, I've said this several times, I hope I don't sound too defensive, but it wasn't because I somehow bettered myself than them. It was just that I didn't, that wasn't who I was. That was just work. It was, well, it was work, but it was a, it, it was a, yeah, it was something that I, I felt good doing. Did you have to face off uh, Renner Forbes? Did you? I did actually. In, in, I did have some cases up there, but they weren't memorable. They were cases where people got arrested for this. What we've been talking about, mm -hmm. but they weren't memorable. And I remember one, and in, in the newspaper had a whole thing on it because I, I, I did one closing up there where I said, you know, it, it's not always going to be. I said this to the judge and the jury. I said it's not always going to be where you have this upper hand because. It's a conservative. It's a conservative place, and and because it's it, it's not going to be too long before it changes. And you should start now. You should make these people should treat them right because you're going to want to be treated right by them. Because it's sort of like, you know, the the it, it's going to turn around. 
they're going to have the vote and they're going to make some changes, which is what happened. Yeah. And, I, and, and my whole talk to them was, don't, don't be stupid, treat them right, and then, and because it won't be long before you're in front of them. So, and that happened. One of, one of the very few predictions I've made that yeah. was accurate. No, were there, there weren't any trials up in Netherland, though, Oh, right? there were. Oh, they municipal, actually had a court oh, yeah, municipal up court, there? Okay. A municipal court up there, yeah. Okay. That's what I was just talking about. Okay. <clears throat> it wasn't very clear, I yeah. guess. That all sounds a little familiar today with kind of the way things... Yeah. Um, actually, let's kind of bring it, wrap up and sort of say, I mean, some of these vagrancy issues are still issues today. I mean, you know, no smoking on Pearl Street and that sort of thing that's going on today in Boulder. But, you know, is there, is there a municipal law? I guess that's a new law, no smoking on Pearl Street. Well, there's state, or, there's state statutes about smoking in public buildings. But um, there's ordinances, yeah, about smoking on Pearl. That's a different thing. In other words, it's not so vague that you can't understand it. Mm, it's, yeah. not, it's, not so, it's not selectively enforced to my knowledge. Um, there is uh, some health and welfare reasons, which there really weren't for the vagrancy statute. In other words, I, and I got away from myself, I wanted to say about the people up on the, the hill, the sitting on the sidewalk ordinance had some basis where you didn't want people sitting in front of your doorway so mm -hmm. other people could come in There's, if people are sitting there, which is what they were doing. Yeah. And as a vague, as a quick thing about the, I remember when I won the, when the, the, it was a big thing in the newspaper when the statute was thrown out and I was sort of, I was up on the hill area with a couple of friends, including Morgan Smith who had joined with me on the case from Brighton. And we were harassed by some, who didn't know us, by some um, hippies up there about, well, why don't, they, they were bugging us for money and they were harassing us and something else. And I was like, just laughing. I said, the only reason you can do this is, I didn't say it, but just, because I'm just in Denver working out so you guys can do this, but don't be picking on me. But they were, they were doing it. I just didn't know what to do but laugh. But I could see where you could be unhappy with that. Yeah. And so there was some basis, and I don't think that things like the vagrancy statute, there's no connection between that and smoking no on, smoking, on yeah. Pearl. Yeah, I mean, I think some, in some places, maybe it goes overboard, and I think it's silly. I don't care. But you don't see any of that going on nowadays in Boulder. I, I, actually, I don't. It may be going on, and I'm not connected with it. Um, I think the camping, the camping is as close as you're going to get to that, mm -hmm. that, I, that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. And I've represented some of the camping. Uh, cases, and my partner uh, Dave Harrison has done a lot of them, and um, I, th I think that's close because that's just harassing people who uh, still you know what the law is. I mean, there's some definition of it. you can argue about some real subtleties to it, but it isn't like any person who you know sleeps in Boulder without having a home. It's not anything like that. You know what it is. I'm sorry that they've passed those ordinances because. You know, there are these people that weren't bothering anybody, and they, for whatever reason, they feel this need to, uh, look, Boulder has a really fine homeless shelter, and three hots and a cot there, those are good meals. They have hot water that I have worked with Boulder County where I went out you know, just not too many years ago, where several, uh, two people at a time would go out in the Boulder County car with hot coffee and hot tea and um, dry socks and a, a, a big van full of warm weather. And, and you'd go down there underneath the bridge and there would be, the wind would be coming through there like a freight train and it would be 10 below. And with the wind chill, it'd be 30 below. And you'd see these people under there say, hey, you know, I'm with Boulder County Cares. What can I do for you? I've got car hearts and warm, you know, boots on, and I've filled up a cup full of hot tea for myself. And we'd be under there, and I'd say, look, you know, they say, oh, you got some dry socks? We'd say, yeah. And they say, you got some smoke? Say, no, we can't do that. And they say, uh, well, what about, do you guys need any gloves? Or we got some sandwiches here, and they'd take some sandwiches. And they say, well, let's give you a ride back to the shelter. 
you, you got, like I said, you know, we got a, you got a hot meal and a hot shower there. And they'd say, no, we want to stay here. I'll never understand that. But if that's what they want to do, I'm sorry that the city has passed, passed ordinances against it. I really, truly am. I don't think they were bothering anybody. Now, I know that there are some who would, you know, you see the city council just gnashing their teeth and, and you know, pulling at their hands and saying, well, we just have to, I, you know. But I think that's, they're looking for something to, to, to get them on, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. I think that's as close to it as it comes. And it's close. I think it's harassing people without yeah. good cause. And like I said, my partner's been real involved in it. I've done some of those cases, but not like he has. And those are, you know, like you say, pro bono. And I don't say that really, you know, it is. Okay, well, anything else? <laughs> Parting shots? <laughs> Do you have, like, three hours more? We can <laughs> no, we're good. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Good. Okay. I, I enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. Yeah, me too.